Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Mo Hamid, uh, current chair of the Measurement Commission at the Institute of Public Relations, uh, also from Radian Partners. Uh, this is the ongoing series that we're calling Measure Up, uh, which discusses the future of public relations and communications, specifically as it pertains to measurement. Today, I'm very excited to have a, a very esteemed guest in the communications measurement space, uh, Katie Payne. Katie has uh, really had such an interesting journey uh, in her career uh, from the journalism side of things to the consulting side of things, uh, having an in-house role in, in, in some cases, and even now um, helping train the next generation of public relations and communications practitioners. So we're very excited to have Katie and uh, we have a lot to discuss today from, uh, you know, from uh, the, the current uh, environment, which is, uh, which is having many folks in the public relations uh, ecosystem uh, change the way that they are uh, managing their function, uh, whether it's in-house or whether it's at an agency. So very excited to have this conversation with you, Katie. Uh, welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm very excited to be here. I love these conversations. Excellent. So Katie, I think it would be great just to start out with uh, with your background, as I mentioned, uh, you've played so many different roles in the ecosystem, and I think that oh, makes yeah. you, uh, you know, uh, someone that has a particularly unique perspective on the past, present, and the future of, uh, of public relations. So tell us a little bit about your journey. Well, my, my, <laughs> I, my major in college was Asian studies, and my goal was to be the New Delhi correspondent of the New York Times. So... Um, I went into journalism because that's what my fathers and uncles and everybody else in my family did. All those books behind me are actually written by various members of my family. And um, so that's, well, the, you know, that was like the family profession was to be a journalist. And um, the trouble was, was the fact that I, you know, was working odd hours and I was in Silicon Valley and I realized that I could make a lot more money money and have a lot steadier job if I went into high tech, except for the fact that I had a degree in Asian studies and Asian history and knew nothing about technology. And so as I kept making my arguments for budget and to do the things that I knew needed to be done, um, I'd always run up against this brick wall of, you know, they didn't believe me, I had credibility until I realized that if I translated everything into numbers and charts and graphs, they go, oh, aha, uh -huh, now I understand what she's trying to tell me. And then they'd say yes, and I get to do what I wanted to do. So I realized that measuring and data and charts and graphs and numbers, and this is back in the um, late 70s, early, uh, early 80s, I guess. Um, and uh, since we started doing that, went to work for Hewlett Packard, um, introduced a little product called the LaserJet. Um, and the inkjet and a few other things. Uh, and then um, had always wanted to move back east, which is where I'm from, in right where I am now in Durham, New Hampshire. And um, so I took a job with Lotus in Boston. Um, and same exact thing, right? You know, had to measure the results. And um, fortunately, Lotus was making the product called one, two, three. So that made life a little easier. And we bought a product called Graph Rider, and that made it easier. Um, but I, a friend of mine basically told me later on that, you know, I'm genetically unemployable, um, that having had, you know, three major jobs in five years that perhaps I wasn't bound to be somebody's employee and they were absolutely right. So I started a little company called the Delahaye Group, which ended up being one of the largest measurement companies. Sold that to what is now Cision, um, said, okay, now what I want to do is run newsletter and, and train people and be a consultant, except that was the 2002 recession. So I ended up going back into management and starting Katie Penn Partners, which got bought eventually by Karma. And um, the uh, finally, in 2013, um, I went back to what I really wanted to do, which is to write, to write this newsletter and to write books and help people understand that and talk about it in a language that they could understand because that's part of the problem is the fact that if you approach it from the academic standpoint, your eyes glaze over. And these people are not in measure, I mean, not in communications because they love math. Mm -hmm. um, so I realized that I could bring that kind of unique perspective um, 
do training and uh, you know into the business. And so now I basically do you know two things. I train three things. I train people. I, I write stuff, newsletters, and stuff like that. And then I really help people put together um, integrated dashboards that, that reflect the real value of what they're doing in a language again that senior leadership can understand. So that's a in a nutshell, that's my history. It's been a long and interesting path. That's a, that's a fascinating story, Katie. And uh, my sense is that you have seen the the space evolve uh, rapidly over time, and in many ways, you've been a facilitator for that transformation. So, talk to well, us a little bit about that that kind of change that uh, has transpired in the ecosystem, and what's different about communications today especially as it pertains to measurement than before. Oh my God, well, yeah, the transition. So, I mean, my motto is you're never wrong, you're just early. So when we had the Delahaye group, we saw our clients, you know, we give them measurement, they'd move up in the ranks and they'd go from managing, maybe, you know, writing press releases or managing PR to managing a bigger communications co function. Um, you know, and then they take on internal communications or event measurement or whatever it happened to be or international. And with every step along the way, we launch a new product. I mean, we, it was like, you know, Delahaye events and Delahaye International and Delahaye surveys or whatever it was, we kept introducing these new products to meet the needs of our clients. Um, but it was still very siloed back then. Um, and so what, what I've seen most well, sort of over time, then we can, then of course the automation came along and that sort of wiped out the business because we had an army of, of people literally clipping out newspaper articles and magazine articles and reading them. Um, and along came um, Radiant 6 and various sort of automated products that were doing quote unquote what we were doing for a fraction of the cost. Um, they weren't, but everybody believed it for a while and you know, a lot of companies left because we were charging way more money than, than the automated companies. And so when I started Katie Penn and Partners, my goal was to make, you know, make measurement affordable either by teaching people how to do it themselves or by mm -hmm. having a product that did things better. Um, and we did that. We lowered the cost significantly, not down to the automated level because we were still using humans um to read and analyze articles but we figure out ways to make it much more affordable so that brought in the nonprofit sector the government sector um you know people like the federal reserve bank people who needed measurement but who had been sort of neglected by most of the measurement folks who were focusing on the you know packaged goods and the big brands so we kind of brought measurement into that whole world. Um, travel and tourism was another one where um, mm -hmm. they'd never been able to afford it and we could do that. Um, and, and so we, we kind of, you know, saw the price come down, we saw the automation come down um, and we, we almost lost that automation, but then people realized that the automation wasn't giving good results, that a lot of the, a lot of the results weren't true. Um, that, you know, positive, negative, and neutral meant one thing to Procter & Gamble, but it's something very different to the Federal Reserve Bank or NATO or the uh, International Monetary Fund. So we were able to sort of retool our, our staff and our products so that we could define positive any way we wanted to. And... Uh, so that was, a, that was a big thing and people realized that, hey, I'm in a unique industry, whatever it happened to be, I need to work with somebody who can customize their definitions of positive or good or bad or whatever. That then evolved into something that is sort of taking off now, which is rather than the simple positive, negative, and neutral thing, um, is to create a quality score for media. So you get with a client and you say, okay, how do you define a good good article? And for example, my, my favorite example was 
you know, for NATO, it's an article that leaves people less likely to bring pitchforks to the gate of the base in Germany, you know, wherever it happens to be. They're trying to, right. they're not, can't even hope for support. They're just trying to lower the opposition. But right. when you take that definition, all of a sudden it applies to a whole nother range of, of organizations. So regulated industries and all kinds of other things. So, so that, that concept of developing a quality score is, is kind of what's, in terms of media management, it's certainly the big thing of the day because I'm seeing it's being copied by most of the old, my old competitors as well as being adopted um, fairly widely in the industry. Sure. Yeah, and part of that uh, evolution in thinking around measurement, Katie, has involved this sort of blurring of the lines between public relations and traditional marketing efforts. In fact, many of the tool providers, uh, some of which you've even mentioned, such as uh, Ra you know, Radiant 6, which is now owned by Salesforce, or, or some of the other companies like Cision, you know, they are now dually supporting both public relations and marketing. And that's such a really... Yeah. It's a really interesting dimension to the functional expectations of public relations relative to uh, to marketing. Every year, I feel like more and more folks are talking about this challenge of just like the, the blurring between the lines, both internally, externally. Communications agencies are hard to differentiate from marketing agencies now. They sort of do very, very similar things. And, uh, and, and, and so it, it kind of brings us to you know, what we're, what we're seeing today in the marketplace, uh, especially, especially as it relates to, to COVID-19. Uh, you know, at the Institute, we're seeing so many uh, folks, both internal uh, communications practitioners, as well as uh, folks from, from agencies and tool providers. Uh, and, and there's only one thing that is common across the board uh, from all these perspectives. And that is this narrative that, the public relations function seems to be going through yet another inflection point, another reset, uh, given the pandemic. Uh, a lot of people, you know, in the uh, outside world, outside of public relations and communications, uh, may not realize this, but organizationally, um, the the sort of uh, burden of, uh, of of communicating and the burden of uh, uh, sort of uh, you know, communicating to employees and customers and suppliers, et cetera, et cetera. A lot of this actually falls on, on the communications function itself. And, and uh, you know, in recent history, there's not really a, a sort of a comparable event that, uh, that the function has had to endure before. So, so what's your perspective on this, Katie? You, you know, in terms of COVID, are things really going to change as much uh, as people are, are claiming for the public relations yeah, I function? I do. I think so. I mean, I think my what I saw happening was that when peso, you know, the whole blurring of the lines and 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 then then redefining things along the lines of paid or shared known, which I would argue is really just you either pay for it or you earn it. I mean, it really isn't for things, but that's okay. Peso makes a nice little acronym, but that right there refocused everything. That's when the lines between public relations and internal communications and marketing all began to blur. And every dashboard I do today is based on that concept. It may not be called that, but it's that's exactly the way people are looking at the world. Now, the interesting thing is that um, public relations used to be, oh, you know, the 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 press release put it out there free stuff um, but now it's it really is seen as crisis and risk and, and crisis prevention and all the rest of that stuff and that's why communications writ large is being tasked with you know yes it's communicating with the media communicating with your employees communicating with all of your shareholders because they understand how to to be authentic how to protect your reputation how to do you know build trust all those things that public relations professionals most of them 
have, have been doing for years. And I had an interesting experience. I mean, talking about with the marketing and the PR board, we just wrote a, um, a communications measurement handbook for higher ed. And we've done higher ed measurement for years on the public relations side and the social media side. And, and you know, that's a whole other topic of conversation because it's a very, very challenging environment because you've got so many different stakeholder groups that are all equally important. So I figured, okay, I could take that expertise and write a book about that. You know, I do, that's what I do all the time. And this, um, my friend, Greg Jarbo, who used to actually work with me at Lotus back in the days, he said, hey, we know a whole bunch about higher ed. Why don't we collaborate? And I learned more writing a book with him and in this ebook with him than I ever knew because he's using search engine optimization and tagging and Google ads, all, all kinds of things in public relations campaigns to achieve Yes, both reputational, you know, increase awareness and get people to understand that, yes, we're now doing this course or this type of thing. But at the same time, they're measuring it by, you know, how many applications they get in and how many people they sign up for the course. And, you know, here's the net net at the end of the day. So it is it's definitely a real blurring thing. And I, I it, it's not, it's not going to get back to anything else ever again. It's, it's always going to be a blurred sense of um, communications function, communications people understand, and good ones do, and ones that measure their results do, they understand how to get messages across effectively, and hopefully, they're also the ones to say, you know what, this message is not going to fly. I mean, in so many cases, I see it's the public relations people to say, no, you can't say that, right? I don't care what legal wants you to say or what marketing wants you to say or what the EO wants to say. In this environment, you can't say that. And yes, they certainly make mistakes all the time. I mean, I you know, write the image patrol column for, public, um, for PR News, which basically does nothing but you know highlight communications errors and, and, and make fun of them. Um, but the... The reality is, is the fact that for the most part, those mistakes are being made, you know, against the will and the advice of the communications professionals. And I think with COVID in particular, back to your, you know, the focus, interestingly enough, the number one, when we first started running back COVID, the number one article on that people were reading in my newsletter was communicating to employees and how to make sure that your, you know, employees that are now working remotely felt heard, felt engaged, were part of it. I mean, it was, it, it really just started with a, with a question to some IPR members and some other um, academics on the topic. And now it's a huge, um, it's a huge piece of the conversation because, I mean, nobody's going to go back to work. There's some two pieces of research came out today, one or yesterday. One was that, I'm sorry if my dog is barking in the background, but, you know, it happens to, it can happen to uh, uh, Nina Totenberg and, and uh, Mara Lies, so I think it's okay. Um, but um, two things that just came out. One is a survey by the Hotel Administration, uh, Hotel Association for Travel, something like that where it's like 20% of the people out there are said they might travel in the next year, 20%. Okay, so nobody's going anywhere. And when asked what kind of vacation, it's like a stay vacation, it's a, it's a drive, it's a, it's, a, um, it's a local trip, it's a trip to family, right? Who's gonna send anybody to a trade show or a conference, right? I mean, if you look at, my argument is, and one of the, we just wrote about this, is how to measure your virtual events, add up the cost of a virtual event. Not just, you know, in terms of personnel and travel and all the rest of that stuff and see what you get for it versus the cost of an in-person event and see what you get for that. And I'm guessing that you get probably the same amount of dollars in and a whole lot less going out. I mean, we were talking to, I was talking to Jonna Burke last night and she said, you know, it's still expensive to do a good virtual conference. I said, I know, but you don't have, 
the travel, the personnel out of the office, everything else. And some chief financial officers out there are going to go, why are we doing this in person event again? Why are we going to this trade show? You know, what's this all about? So I think that, I mean, I think the remote stuff, I think communications people need to get, you know, hopefully, you know, all the tools get better. I mean, there's already major advances in how you do this better. And over the next year, I assume they're going to get even better. You know, Zoom's gotten better in the last six months too. Um, but I, I think we're going to get better at the virtual stuff. And I'm think I'm hoping that people turn to communi to communications professionals to make sure that that human touch and the authenticity and the empathy and all the other things that we do well. Are, are also part of the mix because that's where you're going to lose people. That's where staff, stakeholders, customers, and everybody else are going to walk out the door mm -hmm. if you don't come across as empathetic. Right. Right. Um, so I'm. I, we did a whole issue last year on measuring empathy, and I learned a tremendous amount by that. But there are companies that are doing it really well, and you look and see, okay, who, you know, who's not getting the, the, the angry tweets? Who's not getting the threats of boycott and everything else? And for the most part, it's the, people, it's the companies and the brands that are sounding like humans. They're sounding mm -hmm. empathetic, that are sounding like, and that's the stuff that, for the most part, communications professionals know how to do. Sure, sure. So let's take that forward to measurement, Katie all of the change that we're seeing uh, in, in, in communications and public relations given COVID, do we think that this is going to have, a, uh, have a, an impact on the way in which measurement is done? Because again, at the Institute, we're hearing so many practitioners simply citing the fact that pre-COVID, you know, their sh share of voice in a, in a given category from an earned media standpoint, might have been at a certain level, and almost undoubtedly across all categories, the share of voice in a particular uh, category for brands has decreased because the number one share of voice is COVID. You know, COVID is dominating the news cycle. You know, the, the epidemiological data, the number of uh, you know lockdowns, what different gubernatorial. Uh, you know, yeah. the elected officials are, are saying on a day-to-day -day basis. So what impact does this have from a measurement standpoint? Well, I think that, yeah, I think that when we've seen this, you know, back in, let me see if I can remember the year, I think it was 19, uh, 1980. Uh, so it was 1993 or four. Um, and I can't remember what the crisis was, but there was a crisis, so, you know, it was the recession or something. And we started noticing that the, that the volume of coverage for all of our, 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 all of our clients was dropping. And we realized that in, and when we went back and we looked at, you know, the last four years, every time there's an election cycle, every time that there's an Olympics, every time there's a crisis, yeah, your share of voice is going to go down because back then the news hole shrank. Now it's just that there's, you know, no attention span left. I mean, there's you can put stuff out there, but nobody's going to pay attention to it uh, for anything other than, as you said, COVID or, you know, protests or something like that. And, and frankly, I think the good news is just that most brands are realizing that they can't just jump on the COVID bandwagon and, you know, get anything very effective going on there. Um, I think long-term it's what I'm seeing and actually it's, it's amazing people are going to be much are getting to be much more receptive to this concept which i think you're going to have to figure out how to measure people's feelings and opinions and it is it is a survey right i just i spent a long time yesterday talking to the iabc dc chapter about um about how to measure trust and and relationships and you know i've been doing i've been talking about measuring trust and relationships for 20 years but there's a renewed interest in that and you know the work's already been done it's just that oh now we have to measure trust because if they don't trust us they're not going to walk into their store if they if they don't think that we can keep them safe whether it's an airplane or a store 
um, or a bar or a restaurant or anything else, if they don't trust us to keep them safe, they're not going to walk in. So measuring that kind of thing, um, both in the media and especially in social media and in places like next door and, um, and on places where, you know, a few years ago you wouldn't pay much attention to, um, that's going to be important, but it's not going to be enough. I mean, right. looking at what people say about you in social media does not substitute for a, you know, representative sample survey. And the good news is surveys are getting cheaper. People are, you know, everybody's got survey fatigue, but they really don't. And they do keep on answering them. I mean, you know, pollsters mm -hmm. are going to be annoying for the next few months, but that too will go away. And I think, you know, sometime around February, March of next year, there's going to be a, a resurgence of survey research to find out, okay, how are you really feeling? Mm -hmm. Mary Miller does a wonderful um, talk. You need to put her on here about leaders they do studies where you, you ask people whether they see their leaders essentially just talking about the things that are important or are they actually doing something about them? And it's a, you know, sort of measures a credibility gap. And it's a very, very useful survey. And I'm, mm -hmm. I'm hoping that more people will do that because I think that what you've got is a lot of displaced employees. And as much as I love working from home and you may love working from home, there are people who are very unhappy out there. And you're not, you don't want to wait until they're walking out the door or finding another job to get a sense of are they engaged and are they, you know, do they still love it here? I mean, it was a, I mean, IPR put out a great employee survey today that I, I so scanned, but I mean, it seems like it's fine, but you're going to want to keep doing that over time because the COVID stuff is going to go up and down, right? We're going to, you know, this is a terrible time. April was a terrible time. We'll have another terrible time some other time. And you're going to have to take people's pulse of how they feel, you know, not, not medically, but, but you're really going to have to get a sense of how people are feeling about stuff. So I, I see a shift of, um, towards, you know, true, good, you know, a long time. It takes a long time to program artificial intelligence to do what you want, but it can be done. I mean, we did that showing, you know, that AI can predict a crisis and, um, and tell you mm -hmm. what kind of response, you know, what kind of a crisis it is according to the um, the modeling, and also, you know, the best best course of action. So it's not it's not a switch that you can turn on easily, but that will be um, this time next year. That's the kind of thing I think that AI be, will be used to, to inform us as to how we're doing out there. Sure. Sure. It's not going to be a complete substitute for surveys, but it's going to be um, one way, especially for companies who already have a lot of media monitoring structure in there. If if their vendors are using AI, they're going to they're going to have better. You know. Sure, sure. So, Katie, as we as we move towards the conclusion of this conversation, let's talk a little bit about the future. So, five, ten, fifteen years down the road. What does the DNA of a public relations practitioner look like? And what is public relations doing in the future that you know, might be different than what the function is doing today? Uh, and, and which part of that change are you most excited about? Well, I think the biggest thing, I, I have this theory that, that the worst thing in public relations was sex in the city. Um, because <laughs> the character, you know, the character of Samantha you know, having fun and doing events and everybody wanted to go into PR because that's what Samantha did. I mean, that's not PR. We know that's not PR, but a huge number of people went into PR thinking that that's what it was. And some of them left, you know, some of them modified their approaches to life. Very few of them cared about measurement or measuring anything. So that that cadre of of, of PR types these people, they're not going to have a job, right? I mean, you're going to do virtual events, but the kind of things that people used to pay people like Samantha to do, 
yeah, it's not going to happen for a long time. And it's going to change. People's relationships are going to change. So you're going to do smaller events. I've been measuring events for years. Small interpersonal events where you can have a conversation and not be talked at are way more successful in terms of sales, in terms of leads, in terms of all kinds of things. So PR people are going to be part of the business team because they're part of risks, they're part of crisis, they're part of everything. I mean, they will be, um, they, they've got to get better at financial you know, acumen. I mean, they've got to understand business goal is and how they contribute to it. Um, and I see that coming along. You know, I see mm -hmm. more like the McMaster Syracuse programs where you're getting an MBA as well as your degree. Um, that's going to be a much, those are the people that are going to succeed in the future. They're the ones who are going to be part of the city um, because they're going to be protecting and defending the, 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 the reputation of the company. Um, and I think a lot of a lot of people are going to have to figure out where they fit in this new communications environment. I mean, 10, 15 years from now, you know, so much of what we do every day will be so different. Um, and frankly, predicting anything 10, 15 years, you know, who knows? Who would have expected that we were, you know, where we are today anyway, but that's, that's a dangerous thing. But I do think that it's, it's going to be a business function and, and it's going to be measured as a business function. And my, you know, when I go into a client today and, you know, we talk about, I was working with a client whose goal was to be the, the credible source for financial information. And so we brainstormed on, on what's an indicator of credibility, right? It's, it's amplifying your message, it's sharing your content, it's doing all these other things. So all of these acceptable proxies that we're using today, they'll be baked into the measurement in, you know, five years from now. 10, 15, who knows, but... Um, sure. Um, by that time, I hopefully will be retired and growing better vegetables. I don't know, he's <laughs> sailing. <laughs> I have, but I do, I mean, I just, I think that the DNA, I think you're absolutely right, I think the DNA is going to change, and I think the type of people in the job, and dear God, I hope it's more diverse, and I hope it's better at at looking at the communities that they are talking with, not at, I mean, how long ago did grown to come up with a you know, two-way communications model, and people are not willing to listen, and that's why people are out in the street is because they don't feel heard and if people don't feel heard they will bring pitchforks to your gate and I think that the biggest part of this is going to be that we'll be doing a lot more listening and a lot less talking at a group of target audiences right uh, although Katie I have a feeling you're the kind of person that won't ever really retire just because of you're your right. energy I <laughs> I'm still having too much fun. I really am. I am seriously having too much fun. I mean, I, you know, I was, I was filling out a, a yet another, I'm very good about selling, you know, send me a survey. I will fill it up because I want people to do that. But it was interesting. It was about the things that, you know, you've learned in the last, you know, four or five months about yourself and what's different. And I, it really was a very interesting reflective thing because as much as I, love i love you know i've got great traveling stories and i've seen the world and whatever but if i can keep on doing what i'm doing now from a farm in new hampshire i'll do it forever <laughs> well i think that's a that's a great message to uh to end on katie if you can uh navigate your your public relations career the right way where you might end up one day is uh you know running your your business from a from a farm in new hampshire little to life <laughs> yeah. so, uh, well, I mean, how many people do I know who have gotten to a certain point in their lives where they're not ready to retire and they're becoming the best communications people for nonprofits you've ever seen? I mean, they're revolutionizing nonprofits. And, you know, that's the kind of thing that I think I'm seeing. You know, the nonprofit sector is getting much more sophisticated about measurement these days because it's being run by people who used to be in corporate America and have to, have to, you know, have to right. measure themselves. 
Right, right, absolutely. Okay, Katie, last word. If you have uh, just one or two pieces of advice for PR practitioners navigating the current environment, what would they be? It would be, you know, it, literally go out and put yourself in the shoes of the people you're trying to reach. I mean, this is the whole empathy thing that, that you know, I started talking about a year ago and you see it more than ever. And, you know, you see it in the, in the protests on the streets and you see it everywhere. It's that people make too many assumptions based, I mean, and frankly, sometimes it's based on, on, you know, perfectly good data, but the data isn't granular enough. They're not actually going out there and talking. The best thing that my boss at Hewlett Packard ever did was our responsibility was primarily providing dealer materials. She sent the entire staff out to visit. We all had to talk to at least four dealers somewhere in the country. And we had to spend the day following the dealers around the showroom, you know, computer showrooms. And I learned more in those days and became so much better a communicator because I knew the pain points and what it was like to be the person I was trying to talk with. And we, mm-hmm. back then, we weren't trying to talk with it. It just was really like everybody else, spend more money, yell at them harder. But, but today you can't do that. Anymore. You've got to listen to people and you've got to put yourself in their shoes. And if you get an assignment or a new campaign or whatever, and you, you know, somebody correctly identifies a target audience, is go be that target audience, walk around in their shoes and hang out with them. And you will be so much better at communicating with them. That's such That's such a, such great wisdom for the community. You know, understand your audience, empathize your audience, and that will better equip you to navigate your public relations challenges more than a lot of other advice that uh, the folks tend to give. Get away from your back away from your computer and go be that audience for a while. Excellent. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I think, Katie, that uh, that brings us to a conclusion today. Thanks so much for uh, your, your time and for your insights. I think the, uh, the Institute's uh, ecosystem and, and community will really appreciate uh, this conversation. So uh, so thank you for, uh, for your time. Well, thank you for having me. It was a delightful conversation. And, and I, you know, I hope somebody gets some inspiration from it. Indeed. We know they will. Uh, so, so that's it for uh, Measure Up's uh, newest episode. Uh, we'll be back again. We're releasing the, uh, at the Institute for Public Relations uh, just about on a biweekly basis. So you'll hear from us again uh, very soon. Uh, so with that, uh, that's it for today. We'll, uh, we'll talk to you again soon. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Take care.